I attend. This is a lesson on limiting factors of photosynthesis. I'm just replacing the other one because it didn't appear to have any audio. I might have a bit of background noise. Okay, so first of all, I'd like you to look at this image and I'd like you to see if you can figure out what's going on in it. So you've got a light and it's emitting photons. So that's little packets of light energy. And so you can see that something is happening as the area is increasing or if you were moving something a distance away from that light. Okay, so we're looking at the limiting factors of photosynthesis. We've done some of this in the lesson. So it might be that you were in the lesson and you don't need to do the graphs because you remember doing them. Or it's just a recap for other people and you can answer the exam questions. This is what your spec requires you to know. And you can see that most of it is higher tier, especially the bit about inverse square law. So you might not need to make notes on that as well. Okay, so a limiting factor is part of the photosynthesis reaction that is in short supply, which prevents the rate from increasing any further. So we already know what factors are affecting photosynthesis, and it's pretty much the reactants that go in. So we've got carbon dioxide, I'm going to do it in formula so that it's easier for me to write. We've got water, and then we've got light energy. It's going to put light E. And then also, in order for light energy to be absorbed by a plant, it needs to have chlorophyll. And then that makes glucose and oxygen. And if I'm just going to balance it. So 666, evil number. Okay, so carbon dioxide concentration affects photosynthesis. Water availability affects photosynthesis. The light intensity and the chlorophyll concentration. So if plants have yellow leaves and they don't have as much chlorophyll, they're not going to photosynthesize as much. And then a factor that usually affects most reactions is temperature. So they're the factors that affect photosynthesis. So what limiting means is that it does not matter if you have a massive supply of all of those things. If there is not any light or not enough light, then photosynthesis will slow down. The rate of it will slow down, the rate in which the oxygen is produced in bubbles, which you saw in the practical that you just did. So here is a graph that represents that. So on the x-axis, you've got light intensity, and on the y-axis, you've got rate of photosynthesis. So rate is product over time, isn't it? So it's how much oxygen is being produced in a certain time or how much um, glucose. So when I look at this graph, it has two parts. It's got an A and it's got a B. So you can see that as this increases... So as light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases up to this point. So they're increasing. And what we would say is at this point, it would actually be the light intensity that is limiting photosynthesis here. Because we can quite clearly see that if you keep adding more light intensity, the rate goes up. So it's being limited by the light. Now, when we get to point B where it plateaus or levels off, that means that the rate is not increasing or decreasing. Now, we've been told here that we've still got lots of light. So that must be because of another reason. And because we've not been given any other information, if it's not light, then it's either going to be carbon dioxide concentration, water availability, chlorophyll concentration or temperature. Now, if in that exam question you've been told that we're growing tomatoes in a greenhouse and the greenhouse is at the correct temperature and there's plenty of water available, then you would have to think that it's probably the carbon dioxide or it's the chlorophyll concentration. So you have to go on what the question's told you. So that's what a limiting factor is. So I'm just going to move ahead to this slide. So what you could do is you could draw this graph out. If you've already done this in class, you don't need to do it again. But you label it A and you label it B. And at A, you, I'm going to put a text box in here, actually. Because it's easier. At A, we can say that as the light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis increases. This is the main trend. But what we also need to know here is at this point, light intensity is limiting the rate. Okay. Then what we can do is we can have point B. So we can say here that the rate levels off 
this is because although there is enough light photosynthesis is being limited by one or more other factors and this would be your carbon dioxide so we'd say carbon dioxide concentration we'd say chlorophyll concentration we'd say um, temperature temperature um, we would say water availability so it's one of those so you've got five factors in total if it's not light intensity then it's going to be one of the others so what I would like you to do is I would like you to draw out all of these graphs you'll notice chlorophyll concentrations not there so you'd need four graphs the chlorophyll graph is exactly the same as this water availability graph so you can just put chlorophyll concentration So all those graphs are the same chlorophyll, except for the temperature one. That's different. So I'm just going to go through the temperature graph because that's slightly different. So on the temperature, it's got three changes. It's got an A, a B and a C. So I'm just going to draw those on. So it's got A, B and C. The reason I know that it's got an A, a B and a C is because it changes shape three times. If I'm look, if I were asked to describe that graph, I would be describing the pattern. So I'd be saying the line goes up, it reaches a peak, and then it goes down again. Okay, so at A, it's the same, it's the same relationship in all of the graphs based on what factor is showing. So at A, you've got as temperature increases. The rate of photosynthesis increases at this point the temperature is limiting the rate because we can clearly see that if you keep increasing the temperature up to B then it does increase the rate so we're just being held back by the temperature now why is this so there's I'll, when it, when we're back in school i'll show you a pop song by rachel stevens feel free to look it up on youtube it's called more 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 and i always think about that when i'm thinking about temperature and chemical reactions so i always think more 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 okay and this is because the more heat energy that we have the more kinetic energy so the more heat energy the more the reactants move about kinetic energy the more collisions that we have so you have collisions between the reactants which then makes product so that is why increasing the temperature increases the rate at b we have the optimum temperature And I don't have a figure on here and it will be different in different plants depending on their environments but it's probably not going to be above 60 degrees because that has an impact as well so optimum temperature for photo photosynthesis maximum rate of product formed now at C you can see that the rate of photosynthesis is decreasing the rate of photosynthesis is decreasing because the lines going down so something's wrong isn't it let me just spell this properly decreasing so something's wrong the rate is going down that means that oxygen and glucose are no longer being made or they're being made at a slower and slower and slower rate now this is because the rate of photosynthesis is decreasing because as temperature exceeds 60 degrees enzymes involved in photosynthesis denature which means the product can no longer form now we've not done b2 yet so i'm just going to explain very quickly what denaturing means i'm just going to draw so basically enzymes have got a funny shaped region called an active site so it's called an active site site as in building site not as in the second site and then the reactants have got a certain shape but we call them substrates 
And so basically what happens is that there's a collision between the reactants and the, and the enzymes and they fit together and they then can produce glucose and oxygen. Now what happens at this point here is that that active site has changed shape. So the active site is denatured. And when the active site is denatured, the substrate won't fit anymore, so the product can't be formed. And that's irreversible, so that it's almost like the enzyme's broken. But we don't say in exams the enzyme is broken. We say that the active site has denatured, it's changed shape, and the substrate no longer fits. So that's why it causes a decrease in the rate. So the temperature graph is slightly different. So you can then go on and do this question, which is in your notebook, and this question, and then I'll go through it. Now, this question's got a little bit here about the inverse square law. So just draw again. Now, you're going to need an explanation of that. So, it de depending on what group you're in, you'll have a different question in your notebook. So, if you think you're likely to be doing the higher tier, then you need to continue watching the video. If not, you can stop it and get on with the work. Feel free to continue to watch the video if you want to. Right, okay, so I'm just going to show you this. This is the inverse square law. So what you can see here is this would be the point where the light source would be. Okay, so we would have distance on the x-axis and light intensity on the y-axis. Okay, so what happens is as, as distance increases the light intensity decreases, so it forms a pattern like that. So that's called inverse proportion because it, it's doing the opposite of what you'd think, inverse proportion. So that means that the distance increasing means that the light intensity decreases. Now, when you look at those squares, you probably think, I don't understand why, because that's more like there's more light at, at the further you are away. Now, at each of these distances, you would get a value. So th these are equal distances, but I'm not going to go up in equal distances. Let's say I had a distance of 5, I had a distance of 10, and I had a distance of 20. So I've doubled it every time. To calculate distance squared, I have to times them by each other. So 5 times 5 is the same as 5 squared, isn't it? So 5 times 5 is 25. And then 10 times 10 is 100. And 20 times 20 is 400. So these are all the d squared. So to work out the light intensity, you have to do then 1 divided by 25, 1 divided by 100, 1 divided by 400. If I can remember these off of the top of my head, 1 divided by 25 is 0 0.04. 1 divided by 100 is 0 0.01. And 1 divided by 400 is 0 0.0025. You can check them because I'm just remembering these from yesterday. But you can see that this number here is smaller. So as the distance is increasing away from the light source, the light intensity is getting smaller, which is what that graph is showing. And that's called the inverse square law because we're using squared numbers. And these are called square numbers in maths because you can form a square with them. So the next one along would be a 4 by 4 square. If you can draw it. So you're used to squared numbers. Now, I'm just going to go back and show you why that is. So if you have a look here, when the, when the light source is close, all of the photons hit that area, so they hit that one square. If you move it away, the area where the light has to spread out to, it's not increasing, isn't the light? It's got the same amount of photons, so they'll only actually hit one quarter of that area. It wouldn't be in that particular region. It would be distributed across all of it, but it's been shown like that to make it easier to understand. So again, if you if you double the light intensity again, sorry, if you double the distance again, then you're still only getting light that reaches that square. But it's not reaching that exact square. It's reaching, it's distributing because it's spreading out. But overall, it's only getting to one ninth. So you know how those numbers go up because you do it in maths. So if it was a four by four square, you'd have 16 squares, wouldn't you? So it'd be one sixteenth and then it would be 1 25th, and then it would be 1 36th. 
so you're used to these patterns in math so that's the reason why the light intensity decreases because those photons are having to spread over a bigger bigger area so that will help you determine some figures and understand the explanation to be able to answer this question okay